Hmm. Well, here I am with most of the cast of the second installment of the Transformers War for Cybertron Netflix original series. Earthrise. Tell you what, if nothing else, watching Earthrise made me regret not picking up more of the mercenary factions. I kind of wish I had bug bite and exhaust now to fill out this area over here. And you have the mercenary faction. It was torturous to have to watch and see the Coneheads live, direct, and in full effect, knowing that I can't get I can't get those Coneheads. I can't have them. I can't fill out that roster. <sighs> what a problem to have, huh? If you're watching this, I'm going to assume that you've already watched all the episodes of Earthrise and now you're wanting to kind of get into it a little bit. If you haven't watched it yet, this is going to be fairly spoilerific. So now's your chance to dip out because after the jump, we're going to get into it hardcore. Well, first things first. That was definitely better, right? Wasn't it? Almost every aspect of it, I would say, is better. Firstly, visually, I think the light mapping and the texture mapping on the 3D renders was much more detailed and much more intriguing to look at. Like, I found there was a lot more shots where certain characters and things were really drawing your eye, and I think the textures and surfaces had a lot to do with that. To that end as well, I felt like the world was a lot more full. There were some really like beautiful mats on some of the planets and things, and some of the backgrounds were much richer. Um, I felt like the environment as well was sort of more populated in general. Like there was, you know, a lot of a lot of refractors, reflectors, refractors, reflector, refract. I don't know. There was a, an odd amount of those dudes running around, right? Like if you're at the end days of the war. It does seem odd to me that like you're playing chess and you've got nothing but pawns left. But hey, scrap face paid off. Teaser face! Yeah, the world was much more populated. There was like way more atmospheric effects. I thought like a lot of the explosions and things seemed a little more highly rendered. So I'm hoping that that means the first one did well enough to add some extra backing to the second one, which hopefully means Kingdom will be something else. Secondly, I thought this time around the audioscape was much richer as well. I didn't feel like I was having to sit in the same kind of like cavernous silence that you had in the first one, which forced you to kind of just look and be a little bit like, is this PS2 cutscene graphics? Oh, that's me. I feel bad about that. I might cut that out or I might leave it in. Give it a bit of edge. But I thought the score was better this time. I thought there was more like kind of ambient ambient music and tracks and kind of like just ominous tones like forgetting Sarah Marshall style like boom, 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 murder. It does have to be said though, no disrespect to the voice actors, I'm sure they worked quite hard and you know no disrespect to anyone on the production staff but the voice acting is just one of the big things that I think is letting the whole franchise down on this one. Like, firstly for your big characters like your Megatron, Starscream, Soundwave, Shockwave, like Jetfire, Optimus, you've got people doing impressions of the actual original G1 voice cast performances, um, which just feels off, it feels wrong, it feels a bit a bit cheap. I think Frank Welker and Peter Cullen say it best themselves in um, an interview where they got asked about it at a con. So I'll let them, I'll put this bit in. It's funny, uh, it's kind of a, an unwritten law in the business that we come from and where, when we grew up in the business is you just don't do that. You know, we never take over anybody's voice who can't do it themselves. Right. You just don't do it. But, yeah, it's grand theft. <laughs> yeah, that's happening now with Netflix. Yeah. They're uh, going to produce a, a Transformer series, but they're not going union, and 
you know, we work in our union. You know, that's what protects us all as actors, you know. When other guys, you know, go under deep back and uh, they uh, literally are, you know, they're, they're destroying the union from with outside. It's subterfuge, it's just, uh, it's wrong, it's wrong. So, you know, those big characters aside, I then felt with like, pretty well all the Autobots, it's like, they all sounded more or less the same. Like if you're gonna have someone doing that average a G1 Starscream impression, surely whoever you've got doing Ironhide can give it a little bit of this and there, prime, hey, who? You know what I mean? It just made a lot of the other characters just real background noise. I think what was cool about this one as well is they stayed quite G1 in like the feel and the kind of general sort of G1 narrative, but they were telling a piece of the story that we haven't actually really got before. Like we haven't really explored the journey to Earth as being something like drawn out and protracted like this before. And so that was fun. It's like you sort of knew roughly where it had to end up, but I found for most of it, I wasn't quite sure how they were going to get there. And I think that, that was something that was quite cool. It's, it's like what made Spider-Man, the new MCU Spider-Man film so good, is that we know what happened with Uncle Ben and we know that with great power comes great responsibility. So there was no need to tell that part of the story. Siege felt a little bit like six episodes spent on like the Waynes going to the movies and it ended with them getting shot in an alleyway. It's like, we know that, we could get there much quicker. Another thing that did become kind of painfully apparent with the way the show closed out, on the one hand I was like, mm, yes, you know, do we get to see another taste of some override kind of action? But what the ending of the show, as it was clear, it was like, oh, episode four, five, six, and we still haven't hit Earth. With that, like, you know, finale, Dinobot clock in the mall crashing sort of moment. And maybe like, oh, so they're landing on like a prehistoric Earth. Maybe they time traveled in that sort of dead universe rift into their own past. Maybe they'll find themselves unconscious on the Ark and tie it back into Beast Wars, making that canon. That could be really weird. But in terms of the toys, I think it means that basically anyone who showed, who showed up in, um, Earthrise with a Earth vehicle mode is not going to have that vehicle mode realized in the show. And it also means that characters who just have an Earth based vehicle mode, like Grapple Hoist, Trailbreaker, Run Amuck, Runabout, those guys, they're probably not going to feature in the show at all. Most likely the same with like Warpath and things as well. Because unless we've already seen a character, it's just not going to make sense, I don't think, to have Earth vehicle modes in this prehistoric story that we're going to get told. I did think in that back end when you had like the Nemesis, the Ark, and I can't remember what the mercenary ship was called, but I think it did get a little bit confusing there. And that section of the story is probably the best example of what I found was an issue sort of throughout the entire thing. It was a little bit unclear who was where. Like in the ship scenario, I found it very difficult to keep track of which Autobots and Decepticons were actually in each place and how actively they were being involved. Like did anyone else catch that like random just blip at the end? Where for like one second you saw Astro Train getting arrested and that was kind of the only time he really came into play. So it was like the number of Autobots that kept popping up with Optimus on the Ark, I kept just being like, oh, okay, I didn't know that they were there. I didn't realize they were doing that. And because it wasn't like, it's a big cast, right? I'll pay that. It's a really big cast to keep track of. But if some of it had been more locked away in kind of the different streams of narrative we had going, it might have been a little cleaner and clearer who was where and exactly doing what and to what ends those things were being done. One thing that I do think would have been able to help some of those issues is if instead of it just being like the six episodes or was it eight? Pretty sure it's six. 
it probably needs to be about 10 to 12 episodes. And I think you could do it for not that much more money if you kind of like got a little bit Mandalorian with it, lent into some of the classic like Western storytelling visual motifs of things and letting like, you know, meaningful looks and character models and motions and backgrounds and things kind of largely speak for themselves. You know, RC and Bumblebee were hanging out and it started to become, you know, buddies. It would have been nice with more, with a longer runtime, to be able to just sit with them for just a little while and get to know some of those dynamics a little bit more. It's one of the things that I think really hurt the sequel trilogy in Star Wars. It's like by the time you got to the third one, you were really ham fistedly being told that Poe, Ray, and Finn were like best buds with all their banter and stuff like that. But they never actually took the time to show us that that was the dynamic. So you just were like, this feels forced. What is this? I didn't see any of their hang time where they got to know each other to the level where they felt confident and comfortable with this kind of mid-battle banter. You need a pretty long and established relationship for some mid-battle banter. I think we can all agree that much like was the case in Siege, Megatron well and truly stole the show in Earthrise. That first like first part of the series where we're spending more time with him than say like the Autobots and with Optimus Prime and stuff all knocked out on the arc. Getting to see what he'd had to do in Prime's like, you know, panic move of throwing the old spark. It was just some real rich and deep characterization for Megatron that I think like it's still hard to see him through both of these series as the villain. He just had different ideas to Optimus, was arguably a little more right-wing and militaristic, but at least he wasn't, you know, being like a crazy zealot throwing like life-giving elements through portals to nowhere. I thought Megatron going and visiting, what was it, was it Sector 12? I want to say Sector 7, but I think that's Final Fantasy. Him actually rolling up there unannounced, in person, and like talking to and seeing the bots that he was essentially dooming to have this spark sucked out for Energon to power the nemesis. And in a lot of ways, like they acknowledge it in the show as well, Prime kind of forced his hand in taking such like a hardcore utilitarian kind of point of view with what to do with what was left of Cybertron. Another aspect that I really enjoyed with Megatron was like the way he was clearly haunted by his past. He had a real sort of Thanos vibe to him, I thought, this season in the whole, like, I don't want to do these things, but I'm the only one who seems to be able to see what's necessary for us all not to die. So, like, you know, you saw him wrestling with his conscience when he's getting all, like, Shakespearean with it and talking to Ultra Magnus's head. Um, that was grim. You know, in terms of trying to introduce these iterations of these characters to a new and wider audience, that's a really great way to get to know Megatron, I think. And then when you factor in as well, the dynamic that he had going on with the Leader One and how he kept calling her Ariel, which was like the name back in the Orion Pax days when in the past before they all became, you know, hardcore warriors. And so it's like, you know, he still feels ties and still has memories and he's still hanging on to relationships that he had from before the war that just through a leader's perspective are just dead. Like that Megatron doesn't exist to her anymore. And you can see that that was actually quite confronting for him. Those little quiet moments where people got to actually talk to each other, like you got most of with a leader and Megatron, a leader and Megatron. Those are the moments where you get to really know who the characters are and what they're about. It just adds so much more depth and nuance, and I think it's really important that shows have the space to breathe and let the characters speak for themselves, because if you can relate to a character, you get so much more buy-in, and it just, it really does need to be more than just massive set pieces and big explosions and cool CGI fly-through scenes. Don't get me wrong, have those in it too, but there's nothing wrong with taking a beat, giving it a bit of more of like a Western kind of pacing, and just sitting with your characters for a moment and giving them the space to breathe and sort of let the audience know who they are rather than having to be explicitly told who they are or just knowing, oh, they're a baddie because they're shooting at Bumblebee and the modern world has conditioned me to know that he is a swell fellow. 
actually, just while we're talking, a leader one. When like Megatron's giving like his, you know, giving to the hate dark side of the force speech, um, everything he was saying about how a leader is like the best of them and the smartest and probably should have been a prime and all that sort of stuff. Very, very true. I for one would not mind in the slightest if they're softening the fandom up for the idea of a future female prime in the form of a leader. It's like if somehow Kingdom ends with like a leader having to be the new prime. I'm cool with that. And the leader one's awesome. At least in, you know, this continuity, she's been a badass and well and truly worthy of being a Matrix bearer in my opinion. She may have to keep it in her backpack though. Now, talking primes, let's take a moment on the Big Red himself. I think Big Red might be Einheit's name. Anyway, after his characterization and role in Sage, where he just kept spouting on just follow me blindly, blind loyalty. You need to trust in me even though it seems like I've lost my mind. Look at my hips, not at my face. And trying to sort of actually lead by example a little bit more, which is normally sort of Prime's forte in fiction. Um, there was still a lot of just like I'll sacrifice myself. You leave. You leave. I'll stay. And it's like, there's more to heroics than just self-sacrifice. Like, surely he'd just be dead by now. Like, Megatron did mention that he doesn't seem to die no matter what stupid thing he does. But I feel, I feel like, whilst those big moves are a part of Optimus's character, they can't be all that you're throwing us. I will say this, and huge points. They had Optimus at least acknowledge that he was wrong and made a colossal mistake by killing their whole planet, which is very big of him. But at least it does show some reflection and some growth as a character, and it does show that, like, he's on a redemption arc, and he's, he's trying to undo the damage that he did to Cybertron in getting Earth involved. I don't know, he was better, but like, hashtag not my Optimus. Yeah, I noticed it in the trailer and I hope that it was just something unfinished, some unfinished animation that we were getting, but um, how weird was Double Dealer's face? Why did he have that like, scaramouche? He looked like a primary school bully. Like he looked like he literally should be stealing like the other Transformers Energon lunch money and then you find out that his dad's kind of a douchebag and that humanizes him a little bit at the end and then you just kind of feel bad for his like bully pug face. If they'd done it like the toy, he'd have all those cool angles and like a really like good unaligned chaotic neutral sort of like character to have thrown in the mix. As it was with his like mm, Pugsley face, I found I didn't really take him particularly seriously and given how the show ended up I was kind of right to I suppose. Speaking of, I thought that was some really fun stuff they did with the Quintessons. Like you just got the one Quintesson ship, the one Quintesson, he had the mercenary faction or she so it's kind of like, they, by having just one separate Quintesson, they kind of had license to do whatever they wanted because it was just that one character's machinations at play, not necessarily um, the politics and policies of an entire weird space, spinny face race. I don't think anyone would have predicted the cutting off of the different faces to reach a consensus. That was a really weird and grim touch. That was very cool. It took the Qu like Quintessons as a character and Deseus, this particular Quintesson, to places that we hadn't sort of really gone before with them as a race and a villain. So it was cool to see kind of the one like lone mad Quintesson and those were some awesome little like hints at like the G1 Quintesson origin where it was like, you were made to be slave robots. Nah. I do like as well about that that kind of went largely unresolved with just that like Homer back into the hedge from Ned Flanders. Oh. 
Okay. I'll tell you something that I did really like, and that was that super sick flashback that we got with Skylinks, where we'd been trying to hunt down um, Alpha Trine and get the Matrix, because he was like, I'm worthy of being a Matrix bearer, which is kind of taking, like, his G1 characterized arrogance to, like, it's, you know, most brutal, this is gritty now, where the X-Men in leather, not yellow spandex sort of stylings that we're going for here. That was just awesome, the idea that Skylanks has been, like, banished to the dead universe for all this time, where he, like, had no choice but to literally, like, just examine his own thoughts and change and grow as a person. There was a lot of, like, you know, active encouragement of self-reflection and mindfulness in this show, which is a pretty good message to carry forward. Like, if they're not doing little, like, and now I know, and knowing is half the battle. Um, at least they're, you know, making reflective thought and mindfulness part of the mythology and the story. You know, it's like sort of shonen style, like, work hard and you can do anything. I thought it was a really, really interesting take on Skylinks. Like, it didn't feel like a huge betrayal of the character or anything like that, which was cool. Just a different use of that character. Um, and he made for a really good, you know, trip guide as Optimus had that sort of, you know, Asa the Odyssey adventure through the Matrix. I understood his big sacrifice play as well. You know, he'd redeemed himself. Tryon would be proud. Um, time to, you know, wrap up this loose end. But I can't help but think it would have been really cool to see the way he would have handled himself in Kingdom on Earth with like beasts and dinosaurs and all that kind of stuff. You could have had some cool like, I'm not a Dinobot sort of stuff going on. A character who, like, whose role they sort of definitely didn't seem to draw on any existing fiction for was the big guy over here. Um, it was cool that he was locked in that space station guarding it. So I would probably say in the majority of Transformers fiction, Scorponov normally takes the role as like a, a would-be Megatron, like he's often like a faction leader. Um, he's just another another bad guy on a Megatron scale. He's a great storytelling device when you don't want to just have to, you know, G1 cartoon and Megatron run away at the end of every episode. So I thought like his Hulk voice with the whole like, intruders, impure, man. You know, his whole like exterminate Dalek routine didn't really fit and was a little bit of a waste of the character. I think you could have maybe done that if, as they were running around the ship and things were getting smashed, you had, like, you know, view screens where um, playbacks were getting played that were, like, Zarek's last recordings of, like, things have gone bad, things on, I, th I think it was Nebulous through the portal, right? Was it? I don't know. Things are going bad on the ground, nothing's working out, I'm gonna have to take extreme actions, I may have to become something bad. And then you'd get like a little bit of the, you know, like the Jekyll to the Hyde, or the Hyde to the Jekyll, whichever way that goes. The Banner to the Hulk, that's more my wheelhouse. I think that would have helped flesh it out a little bit more, that whole sequence. Instead, you more or less just had Optimus being like, I'm gonna sacrifice myself again, again, more sacrifice. Uh, really taking that wit wiki motto to heart. Just lumbering oaf giant is, you know, not the way to do it. I did also appreciate that his scale in, you know, robot mode worked with the scale of the toys. So I know in a lot of fiction he's like, you know, a city bot. But I did think that, that was cool that everything that you see on screen, you can do with your figures if you want to at home. And I do want to, and I will. Now I know that in, in the fiction, and I think it's the UK comics, there is a precedent for Galvatron doing some time traveling shenanigans to make sure that his timeline goes the way he needs his timeline to go. Brutal as Galvatron was, there were a couple of things that bothered me about his inclusion in it. Firstly, I did not care for his head sculpt. It felt out of place and a little too 
a little too smooth and generic for how intricate, obviously, the toy-based characters are. I think they did a really good job with Alpha Trion, but just Galvatron felt a little, little Tony to me. I also had kind of expected that he would have, like his involvement in the story might have some kind of bigger implications and consequences, and I suppose with Cyclonus and stuff being in Kingdom, that might have just been seeding some story elements for the next phase, which I hope is the case. So fingers crossed, Galvatron and Cyclonus come back and play a role in Kingdom. With the weirdness of which figures go where, I really feel like Scourge should be over there in Kingdom with the Cyclonus we know and the Galvatron we dare to hope for. What you gonna do? Once you buy them, you can display them how you like. That's the beauty of the whole deal. Amongst all of that kind of like dead universe, not this, not that, hopping madness, was it not fantastic though to see that tantalizing little hint of Unicron? Which may have just been like, you know, the promotional art that just way put menacingly. But it was still cool. I don't know. I'm hoping that that was a little bit of foreshadowing and setting up some ideas and things to come into the next season, which given the golden disc makes a lot of sense. I did enjoy that like that image of Unicron that we did get to see was clearly modeled on the HasLab toy that we're getting this year. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I'm actually pretty keen with this one to almost immediately go through and give it a rewatch. Like, I, I want to just watch it again and see what things I miss and what extra details and things and little nods and references to the lore I can soak up. Like, it wasn't until the second or third episode that I actually noticed in the opening credits that you were seeing sort of all the planets that they visit on those Galactic Odyssey toys. So that's like a potential nice tie-in. Given how short a period of time we sort of got to see this story over, there could have been side missions. We don't know that. So on the whole, I'd have to say I definitely enjoyed the Earthrise experience much more than the Siege experience. It felt like more went into it, which maybe Siege was kind of like, almost like the pilot episode where they were just kind of gauging interest and reception in the project before they invested anything heavier into it. I'm hoping that this leads to toy sales, which leads to bigger investments into the content and maybe we can expect some more of this in the future like post kingdom who knows i think that pretty much covers it are there any cool details things that you really enjoyed that i think i missed in my breakdown and my take on it how did you feel this one compared to siege and are you now looking forward to kingdom who are your favorite bots who do you wish got more screen time i just want to get into it with people and know what you thought so if you enjoyed this run through and breakdown be sure to let me know in the comments like subscribe, subscribe again, and I'll catch you on the next one.